while um, I'm getting ready. Hey, Jesse, why don't you and David name us head this way? My mother-in-law is on injured reserve once again. We did this once before. Carolyn, my mother-in-law, makes baby blankets for all the new babies in our church. She's on injured reserve. We don't have a baby blanket this morning, but we're not going to pass up the first time that Amos comes to church. Um, can we use this one here? Come right over here. Um, are you doing the honors? The, would you rather hear him or Jesse? Maybe she's or Amos. Tell us a little bit about who we have here today. Uh, this is this is Amos Walker, and he was born on October twelfth. Um, so he's either spent most of his little life in quarantine or in the hospital. <laughs> so <laughs> this is his first big outing into the world today, um, and we're really happy he gets to be here with all of you and with us. Um, he's named for family, and of course Amos is biblical, but. Uh, uh, both of the Amos it's, and, and it's not Amos Moses. No, it's Amos Walker, not Amos Moses. Okay. I really wanted a theme okay. song, but I got voted down. <laughs> yes. He's heard a lot of stories since he's been born. But anything else you want to add to that? He sleeps well at night, doesn't keep you up? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> as well as an almost seven year old who thinks he's a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? We're excited to have Amos here this morning. Can we have a word of prayer? God, we thank you so much for bringing Amos into this world. Uh, I pray that all the days of his life that you will watch over him and that you will bless him and that the prayers from this church would support him and that he might fall in love with you and love your word. And he might not even know why, but it would be the answer to the prayers of the people here praying for him today. We thank you for his parents who have such a wonderful love for you and it's such a great thing to see them having a Christian home reading the Bible and going to church and living as Christian and raising their children to love the Lord and I can't think of a more beautiful thing for a family God and so I pray as Amos grows up in this family I pray that you'll keep him strong and keep him safe and always loving you we pray this in your son's name amen and we have a gift coming your way okay my mother-in-law is worried about it. I don't know if I've told you this or not, but it's tough for an Oklahoma kid to admit this, but I'm actually a Kansas kid. Uh, I'm the typical... Kansas boy because my mom and dad worked at Boeing when my dad got out of the Navy got a job at Boeing my mom worked there her name was uh, Joanne Wadsworth and they met at Boeing and and uh, my sister and I were born in that area and my mom grew up in Mays and we lived in Mays Kansas for a little bit uh, so I actually choke it down I, I was born in Wichita I know, I hate to break your heart, I wasn't born in Oklahoma, but my heart's Oklahoma. Uh, all my life was spent going from Oklahoma to Wichita to Mays, back and forth. Um, and, you know, uh, my dad had a great job being an electrician at Boeing, but he did, it was just too big a town for him. And my dad wanted to move back to a little town and raise his kids in a small town, so he taught himself a new life skill. and. Uh, became a barber in a small town uh, and so we spent the rest of our life you can still drive through Cleveland and on downtown in the middle of Cleveland is a barber shop say sportsman's barber shop still painted on the window with the barber pole but he's not there but it brings tears every time you drive by there uh, so I'm I kind of like I think it's cool uh, to have those memories um, and, and I learned early on from my father, I guess, just being around him, that my dad was really grateful uh, for everything we had, even though he had given up a lot to move back to a small town. He always said it was the greatest decision that he had ever made in his life, raising his kids in a small town, because Cleveland was a lot like Mayberry. Uh, it was just your typical small town, a lot of similarities. 
Uh, I know you think I'm fibbing when I say this, but at 97 in my high school class, Cindy here in Fredonia had 97 in her high school class. My grandpa was named Clint. Her grandpa was named Clint. And we didn't learn a lot about this till after we got married, which is kind of freaky. Uh, we lived a quarter mile down the road from my grandparents. She lived a quarter mile down the road from her grandparents. And all these things just start rolling in. You're just like, wow, it's kind of a lot of wonder if that's why God brought us together. We've got a lot of similarities we didn't even know about before. It's kind of one of those neat things to figure out, uh, especially when you've had rough times in a marriage to remind yourself of. Uh, remember, hon, we have a lot of in common. <laughs> uh, and during this time of being thankful and being grateful, uh, you know, I think of Carolyn, my mother-in-law, sitting around the house the other day and um, it was our first time without Junior and to have a house full of family, to have a house full of grandkids, to have a house full of great can Because, man, we get to together now, there's like 50 of us in there and everybody's having kids and everybody's moving on. And, and that's what a mother loves, is just to sit at that big old table and hear all that noise and all of my family has surrounded me and mothers are really, they love that. Uh, there's something very fulfilling to them about just hearing the noise and smelling the smells of the food and hearing all the, everybody talking at the same time and just, just all the racket. And, and mothers are thankful in their hearts to God about that. that that's a real blessing. Because in the ministry sometimes I minister to people, they don't have anyone. They're, they're all alone. They have nowhere to eat. They have people invite them out to a restaurant for Thanksgiving. I have never in my whole life ever ate one Thanksgiving dinner in a restaurant. I should be thankful that I've always had a family and a place to go to be surrounded by love. And are we thankful for that? Do we say, God, you know, I know those mothers sometimes... And like my father, he would think he would just sit around and look at all that. And, and what, my, what made my dad happy was just like a mother to have everybody come home. My dad would call me at college and I'd answer the phone and say, hello, 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 hello. Okay, dad, hello. Well, I just hadn't heard your voice in so long. I wondered if you were my son. All right, you know. You know, are you coming home for Thanksgiving? Yes, sir. Well, you better be, you know. And, and are you coming home for Christmas? Well, the el you t let me talk to those elders. Who's scheduled? I'm like, Dad, you're not talking to the elders of the church. I will be home for Christmas, you know. Um, and, and, you know, you think, man, we're, we're, we're blessed, aren't we? You, you look around this room, and, 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 and do you stop and look at your spouse and think, well, I'm really lucky. I mean, some of you in here, you're really lucky. Have you ever looked in the mirror and said, you're really lucky? Look at you. I mean, I was at a funeral with my brother in Cleveland this past year, and I was trying to recognize people from high school and places, and I said, is that so? He goes, yeah. I said, oh, come on, that's not, that's them. I live here. That's who they are. Well, they, he goes, well, what do you think you look like? You're 65 and haven't been here forever. They probably don't recognize you. I'm like, wow, that's kind of a humbling thought. Am I thankful for what I have? Do, am I thankful for Cindy? Are you thankful for the person that you're married to? Do you stop and just slow down for a moment and pull over and put it in park and think, man, I'm blessed. I'm married to someone that loves the Lord. I'm married to someone that wants to go to church. I'm married to someone that wants to read the Bible. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't think that is awesome, go out into this crazy world for a while and look around. You will come home and think, wow, I am so lucky. <laughs> I'm telling you. I mean, go work at a convenience store at 3 in the morning. 
You'll come home and think, wow, I'm very lucky. There's some crazy people in this world out late at night. You look at, look at your life. Look at what you're like. Look how ornery you are. And someone hired you in a vocation. You're, you're blessed to have a job. You're blessed to have an income. You're blessed to have someone put up with you. Look how crazy we are about certain things. I, I mean, wow, how does anyone put up with us? You ought to be thankful someone hired you and wants to tolerate you and pay you for what you're doing. I mean, we're blessed. Look at, look at how, did anyone here live in a home last night that had no heat, that had a dirt floor? Did everyone here sleep in a soft bed? and have some warm water to take a shower? I mean, we, we are a, a, a very blessed people. Did you thank God about it? When you look at Colossians chapter 3, this is what it says in verse 15 and following. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you were called to peace. Remember all the songs when you come into the Christmas holiday? Remember all, I mean going back, what did Coca-Cola perpetuate? Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. We need to pray for our military because we're getting ready to hook it up with Iran. As you speak, we're moving warships into the Persian Gulf. Um, and we need to pray for our soldiers. I, I remember parents, when I was a youth minister, would come forward at church and get on their knees, and I was in charge of doing the decisions at the countryside, and a dad or a mom would say, I got a letter from my son. He's an Army Ranger and you can write a letter before you go to war to your parents but you can't tell them where you're going but they will know to pray for you and they said we got a letter from our son and he's being shipped out and your heart goes out to them because they're worried they're, they're maybe going into combat and we have a lot of men and women who we love and care for that need our prayers and Sometimes we're so busy worried about quarantining that we forget we're still in the longest war we've ever been in. It's not over yet, but we just kind of act like it's not there anymore, and it's very, very real. We live in a world that's difficult to understand what peace is. You want to go out to those that riot and cause trouble and say, do you, do you not understand what you're doing? Just, you wish to have the power of God to just freeze everybody for a minute like Jesus could and just say, stop and think about what you're doing. Go home. Look at the lives you're destroying. And, and, and we want peace to rule in our hearts. Do, do we even understand what peace is? Let the, the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The best way to show thankfulness in your heart is to love the things that God has done for you and live your life as if you don't need anything else what else do we need we have been so blessed to have God love us when he ought to kill us that he has showed mercy on us when he ought to destroy us 
like Terry was saying, that he gave us a covenant that, listen, you don't got to worry about it when it rains a lot because I'm not going to do that again. And that's what I want you to remember. I love you. I'm going to take care of you. You will have to stand before me someday. And I think we will stand there doing our Elvis impersonation. Because when you stand before him, your knees are going to shake. In fact, you're not going to stand when you come before God because that fire is going to make you go face down because you're going to be afraid to look at him. That's how, if you've never been that intimidated in your life, you will be the day you stand before God because you'll know that he has all the power to destroy you in that moment and you're going to beg for mercy. Yet you just will because that power will demand it. Just being within his presence. Remember that everybody in the Bible, from Mo, everybody that came, what did they do? What did Peter do? What did Moses do? God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I mean, they just went down coming into that presence of the power of God, and, and we will too. But we need to learn to cultivate to be thankful for we are just so blessed and during this time period is a time where we we develop this gratitude in our attitude for everything we do it it should bring peace to our hearts um, in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 says the fruit of the spirit is love peace patience faithfulness gentleness and self-control. In a, in a world of political polarization, wow. Does anyone talk about peace? I know people talk about getting even. People talk about being right. People share a lot of words back and forth. Uh, but man, wow. Wow. And I know it's difficult, and I want to give you confidence to reassure you. I have been the minister of a church in Missouri where one of our elders in our church was the most powerful political figure in Missouri. Senator Webster was one of our elders. And so I have worked with a political person who loved the Lord. He was the college Sunday school teacher at our church. Uh, he looked just like Abraham Lincoln. Cindy goes, you've never met Abraham Lincoln. I said, but it had to be like Senator Webster. And he was real tall, and he just kind of looked like Abraham Lincoln's pictures. And he sound, And she goes, you don't even know what Abraham Lincoln sounded like. I said, it had to have been like Senator Webster. You know? But he had Bible studies in his office, and he met with Christian political people, and and when his funeral was one of the biggest funerals in the history of that town, and um, there were people coming in big fancy bulletproof cars from everywhere, and um, you know, and they said at his funeral he was the most powerful political person in the history of Missouri. And I thought, and he loves the Lord, and he's one of our elders at our church. Isn't that cool? There's not enough O's in cool. To, I mean, that that is, and he goes to our church, and he. And he tells people about becoming a Christian and reading scripture. And there are people in Washington who do care. I know it's hard. Even from, I know we doubt that and we think there is nobody there that loves the Lord on either side. You know, there, there are. There are people that want to make a difference. Now, I wish they would step forward real loudly, but I mean, I'm going to tell you something there are and you've got to believe that you got to have faith in that but we are in such a political polarized world right now I mean here, here's what I struggle with you know all, all the politics stuff I, I can't stand I never have like politics um, but what bugs me as a person is the hatred and the anger I don't like to see people be ugly I don't think that God wants us to be that way my parents didn't want me to be that way. My grandparents didn't want me to be that way. Yours didn't either. 
uh, and when we see the rioting and when we see the anger and the, I think we all struggle with that because it's not something that God wants of our lives. Even if you were not a Christian, that's not the way we should be living. And I think if we are a Christian, so much more that we should be letting, he says, let peace rule in your heart. Wow, that's difficult in these times, isn't it? I mean, as you're going into these discussions that you have with people over all kinds of things, you're thinking, let the peace of Christ rule your heart. Be at peace. And you know who has taught me over 40 years? Because the, the, I'm a warrior. I'm, I'm a kind of guy that draw the sword and let's get after it. Let's throw the tables and the best man wins. If I win, you're going my direction. And if you win, I guess I'm going your direction. I mean, I'm a warrior. And I'm a warrior that met Carolyn Ratzliff. And I got humbled. I got humbled by a mother-in-law who is a person of peace. Wow. Is a woman of no... And, and Junior was a warrior. You all know Junior. Uh, man, she is a person of peace. She is a person of no... She would die before she would have conflict. And I've always heard them say in these quotes about war, in books that you read from military, that the people that decide wars in the world should be the mothers. Because it's their children that die in the war. They should decide whether we have wars or not. Not the political people that talk to the moms. Because my mother-in-law has taught me over the years. I'm, I've never grew up as a person of peace. I'm an athlete and I'm a warrior. But my mother-in-law taught me over 40 years that peace rules. Let's don't have any conflict. Let's have peace. And, I, and I'm proud to be able to say that because it's something that I have learned about this scripture from her. Let it rule in your heart in everything that you do. The Christian who lives by the fruit of the Spirit is rewarded by God with what? Be unable to lay your head down at night with a peaceful heart. Um, I can ask it. Well, you're all sitting right beside each other. I mean, Johnny, Kenneth, Jessica, the day you became a Christian and when you went to bed that night, was that not one of the neatest nights you ever laid down your head to go to sleep? Yeah, because you took from your life and you laid it at the foot of the cross and you said, God, I give it up. Turn me into a different person. And when you do something for God and follow God's ways, he rewards us with a peace that only God himself can give a person. And that's true. And we live in a world that needs to understand how to do that. They need peace in their heart. If your heart has no peace, I don't know if you can have a good marriage. If you have no peace in your heart, I don't know if you can lead a group of people. If you have no peace in your life, I don't know if you could really run a business properly. We, we need to let this peace be a part of our lives. And it only is, God is stubborn. He it, it even said in the Ten Commandments, I am a stubborn God. It's my way or the highway. And if you want this peace in your life, it will only come by living by the fruit of the Spirit. That's it. Look at the scripture and read it for yourself. But if this peace does live in your life, then enjoy being thankful during this holiday season with the gratitude because you're blessed. It should cause a spirit of giving in our lives. 
he says, you know, let this dwell in us richly. Uh, when the word of God lives in you and dwells in you, 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 he says to teach, admonish, sing psalms. Uh, Paul quotes Jesus. This is one of the most confusing verses in the whole New Testament because Jesus said it, but Paul quotes him, but Jesus doesn't say it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's said in the book of Acts, chapter 20, by the apostle Paul, and he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. But it is. Um, you know, when, when you have God living in your life, when you have peace in your heart, you feel like you want to share with people so that they can enjoy the same thing. And I think that is so important for us to learn. Uh, how many of you had a father that ever said, I don't want you to get me anything for Christmas. Probably every father that represents every family in here. They would rather do things for everybody else because they enjoy that spirit of giving and seeing what it does to other people. And there's something when you live a life of going and giving and doing. And I remember uh, Dee, when I first moved here, you know, I'd shoot a deer or something and and I would come up and I would give it to Dee in the high school and Dee would, they would go out and dispense it to people in need with the basketball team and teaching the guys how to be in the spirit of giving in their lives uh, through sharing with other people. There, there's, a, there's a neat feeling in your life when you've driven around and helped other people and filled their freezers and, and given clothing to people that need it and go home and think, wow, I, I, I've gained more peace in my heart from doing that than anything else that I've done. There, there's a rewarding about that in our lives. So when he, when he gives us in teaching here to, to teach, give back, learn to give back, and, and, and learn to admonish. Uh, admonish seems to talk about warning. You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and, and you got to remember, oh, here we go. <laughs> what did I hit? I, I hit on, I'm alive now. Okay, you want me to stay here? Or I'm good to go. Okay. Um, I, I, I'm distracted just a tiny bit. Where was I? Okay. <laughs> you know, um, what we forget in that passage in Timothy is to where it says, the scripture that you hold in your hands, and we forget this occasionally, is God breathed. That means that all the scripture that we have and that we're taught from, yes, it was written by other people, but it was inspired by God and written through them physically. So the words that you read are God speaking to every one of you, they're His words. They're from him. And it says that the scripture that you read is useful for correcting and teaching and showing people how to live the way God wants us to live. In fact, in there he uses the word where we get the word gymnasium in training. Useful for training people to live the way that I want them to live. You know, and I, and I think it's important for us to learn to warn people about, hey, don't live that way because God wants us to live this way. And wow, we've paid a huge price for that in America. We've wanted a country without God. We've wanted a country without churches. We've wanted a country without the scripture. And you know what? We got it. And we're paying a huge price for that. He says to sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. If the word of Christ lives in you, how many of you, let me just take a survey, how many of you, when you're out working, when you're out mowing, when you're out doing something, when you're out driving, have ever sang a hymn from church or a song that we sing here? That you're going, yeah, I see you. Okay, I did it. It, it, but do you remember which song? 
uh, well, you'd be putting me on the spot. But I mean, I'll be going around mowing, and, and, and all of a sudden, I'm singing one of the songs from Sunday. Uh, you know, if, if God fills your heart with his presence, and, and, and he's living in you, all of a sudden, he's put a song in your heart. He's given you something to sing about, not something to cuss about, something to sing about, something to be thankful for. Isn't that cool? I, I really do. How many of you remember what song? You do? Trenton, what song? Hey, there you go, man. All right. You did it. Man, that is so cool. Because what does he say there? Do this. Teach, admonish, sing with gratitude in your heart towards God. When you're looking at how he has blessed you, you're going to sing about it. You're going to thank him for it. You're going to come to him and say, God, I give to you because I'm blessed. In Psalm chapter 30, it says, O oh Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. It has to come from the heart. It says, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, he says in this text, that means that his principles ought to guide us in our decision making. Boy, that's tough in the world we live. You, you say that you're a Christian man, a Christian woman, a Christian teenager. I, I, I started developing this as a Bible college athlete, and I thought, you know, all my life I had played sports and wanted to be very physical in those sports, and if you hurt someone, who cares? And trying to be a Christian man and be a, because in, at the Bible college level, our coach was a Christian. He would sit our basketball team every afternoon down or our baseball team and he would give a, a devotion before every practice. That's something I did not grow up with. And my coach was reading the Bible and saying, let's have a devotion, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll start practice today. Um, and that was something new to me. That, that was a place I had never gone. And so I thought, how do you become an aggressive athlete and live as a Christian while you're playing a sport where it's very physical? So to reach down and to help people up and, you know, if you, you know, if you knock people down, help them up. If you play hard, tell them, hey, after the game, congratulations or whatever, shake their hand and live as a Christian by, you know, it's a whole transition of life, of learning to be complimentary uh, and still be an athlete. Uh, was a new lifestyle change for me, and I enjoyed it. I, I thought it was cool to meet other Christians that way. Um, and it can be done because uh, his principles, if you're living for them, ought to guide your life and everything that you do. One of the toughest places we laughed about it in here is out at the cattle chute and in the cattle pen. You know, people go to church, and in America, see, if you're not from a ranch or farm family, it's okay to lose your Christianity in the cattle pen as long as you gain it before you're walking back to the house. And everybody forgets about what you were like down there versus what you're like up here. And so I've always made it a goal of mine to where, no matter how bad things get, to be a Christian in there and to be a Christian back here. And that consistently they can say whatever they want. Um, he's a Christian in both places. That's always been a big goal of mine. And it can be done, I'm going to tell you. Uh, but you've got to work on it if you did not grow up that way. Be thankful in every circumstance. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you 
in Christ Jesus. I heard a man say, God never expected us to be happy with, but to give thanks in the circumstances of this life always. William Bradford, the man that said that, his wife drowned, and most of the people that he was living with had died as he was trying to live in America, coming over on the Mayflower. He had lost his wife and friends, but he developed and cultivated a thankful heart in all circumstances because God has blessed us. You can't always say, I want more before I'm going to be happy. You've got to be blessed with what you have, even if you're not given anything else. You've got to cultivate a thankful heart to this God that we love. We live in very difficult circumstances right now. A lot of us are going to be so ashamed two years from now because when we finally find out something that we thought we knew right now, we're going to be so sorry for the way things have done and been handled uh, because there's just so much confusion. There's so much uncertainty. There's so many unknowns. But through whatever we deal with, we should deal with it that letting peace in all circumstances rule our hearts. Let's don't go and make idiots out of ourselves. Let's don't go and make fools out of ourselves. I don't have to be right and you don't have to be wrong. We can, this is my friend I'm talking to here. This is my loved one I'm talking to here. In all matters, right or wrong, we're going to be friends. I love you and you're my friend. I care for you and you're my family, we're going to let peace rule here as we deal with these circumstances. It's not always easy to do that. But I think it's what God wants. And it says that by doing God's will, that's how he blesses us. He doesn't bless us for doing what's wrong. You don't reward bad behavior in your dog. You don't reward bad re behavior in your horse. We don't even reward bad behavior in our cattle. We had one going through, man, we was just working cattle, having a good time yesterday. One of them was acting up. That one's going to the cell barn. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, isn't that, we don't reward bad behavior. Well, why would we want to go out and think that with humans, it would be any different? God doesn't reward bad behavior. He rewards good behavior. And that's what we have to remember. And this is a time, no matter what we think, to be thankful. We are a very, very blessed people. I heard a man say as we close this this morning, when we look at what we want and then compare that with what we have, we shall be unhappy. When we think of what we deserve, then what we have, we shall thank God. As you leave here today, think about how blessed you are. Not how much that things are empty and you need this or need that. As you leave here and drive home today, look at what you're driving. Look at how you're living. Look at where you're going to eat. You are so blessed. And there's so many people that would go home with you, that would ride in your passenger seat and say, wow, you have a lovely automobile, you have a lovely home, you have great food, you have a great family. You should be blessed. You are. And that's how God wants us to live with that kind of attitude as peace rules in our lives today. If you have a decision that you feel that you need to make this morning, Feel free to come forward as we stand and sing our invitation hymn.